I think most important is to be willing to look at the bigger picture, you know, to not get hung up on the nitty gritty details. That, that's what also happened to me in my previous corporate life too often. You, you became good in something and you kept, you know, you were running the system harder and harder, faster and faster, but you kind of lost sight of what's actually important, right? Hey everyone, welcome to It's a Material World. We're the show that uncovers why material science will change the world. Consider subscribing and hitting the like button down below. It would really help us out. And before we get started, just wanted to mention that we have released material science merchandise for those of you who want to support us or just express your passion for MSE. You can check out more of the designs at itsmaterialworldpodcast.com forward slash shop or by clicking the link in the description. All right, let's get right into it. Hello, everyone. Uh, our guest today is Matisse Fussel, the CEO of Beyond Service Technologies. After just a few minutes of talking with Matthias, his passion for sustainability in textiles was very evident. Uh, he's been working in the textile chemi chemical industry for more than 30 years now, and beyond surface technologies, his partners with huge brands such as Patagonia, Adidas, Lululemon, in an effort to become more sustainable in the clothing space. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Matthias, and we're excited to talk to you about green textiles. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Cool. So like David mentioned, you've had several years of experience at both traditional and green textile chemical companies, and we'll get into the differences in a little bit, but right now let's start with the basics. So what exactly are textile chemicals and what applications can they be used in? A good question to start with, <laughs> because I, <laughs> I, I, I can be, uh, easily imagine that if you're not part of the industry, uh, it's hard to see the breadth of chemicals or chemistry that's been used in our industry to get from a fiber to a yarn, from a yarn to a fabric, eventually to the garment we wear. And uh, the same is true for any technical textile or home textile application. It may be easiest to explain a bit more, more tangible uh, in, in an example like the shirt I'm wearing, right? Basic shirt, you know. If you, if you follow me through the process for a couple of minutes, I think you'll see what I'm talking about. You know, okay, that shirt is a cotton shirt, so you have the fiber, you know, you pick up the fiber from the field, you know, first thing you need to do is you gotta wash them, right? You know, it's pretty dirty, you gotta wash them. And, and then once you have those fibers pre-cleaned, you wanna make a, um, uh, a yarn out of those fibers. So to do so, you know, you need to add lubricants. You know, you can't just spin fibers. It wouldn't work. The machine wouldn't run. So here comes again, you know, after the detergent, you know, there's lubricants. There's another uh, base set of, of chemistries being applied. Um, once you have the yarn, you want to weave the fabric. You know, you want to make a shirt. And to weave a fabric, you need to first um, size the yarn so it can withstand the weaving. And uh, once you have done the weaving, you need to remove the sizing because the sizing would impact uh, your dyeing. So you need to um, scour, wash again uh, that shirt, and then you need to prepare it for dyeing. So you have another wet processing with chemicals, scouring agents, additives. And then once you get it into the dyeing machine, you have to use a lot more chemistry to make sure in the dyeing machine, you, you don't get any creases, you know, your dye stuff gets on evenly. Um, your fastness of your dye stuff is fine, so you can actually wash it. And once that's done, you know, up to here, we call these chemicals processing chemicals because they're used for processing the fabric. They don't create any effect for the consumer, but they allow us to take the fiber to the fabric stage, you know. Now comes uh, what we call the finishing chemistry, and this is where our company specializes in and focuses uh, on mostly. Uh, those are the chemicals that you add after the dyeing that actually enhance performance of a fabric. Like this cotton shirt, if you wouldn't apply certain chemistries, you wouldn't be able to wash it, right? It would shrink. It, oh. it, you couldn't wear it anymore. Um, it wouldn't feel soft. Um, 
you know, you it wouldn't absorb your sweat, you know, it wouldn't feel comfortable to wear. So there's a lot more chemistry then being applied um, after dyeing that we call effect chemicals that give the fabric all the nice properties we want to have. And then the, the fabric gets made up into a garment and not unusual even that garment then is taken to a washing process where further chemistry has been added to give it the final touch so you know and and that's a simplified run through the process mm -hmm. so we are talking about 10 to 15 industrial processes in each process step chemistry has been used um, and so it is a breadth of chemistries it is quite a massive industry actually uh, lots of chemical being used main categories process chemistry effect chemistry wow that that is such a crazy process that i had no idea about now i know why all these t-shirts cost so much money to make um <laughs> if you had to if you had a guess uh, i'm just curious because you're talking about uh, you put on chemicals and you take them out because they only do specific steps along the process how many different chemicals do you think a shirt has like seen in its lifetime before it even gets to the consumer. Let's just talk about chemical groups, right? Mm -hmm. That within each chemical group, there may be more than one product. Yeah. Uh, uh, easily 15 to 20. Oh, wow. And, wow. and again, I think this is the surprise <laughs> for quite many people that aren't part of the industry because we, we 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 tend to look at a garment and say well yeah that's a shirt <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure so so you mentioned that these textile chemicals are used like almost as an in-between step it seems like from fiber to fabric fabric to garment etc so what materials are like implemented or what materials make up mm -hmm. some of these textile chemicals well, it's a petroleum world <laughs> um, so so basically um since more than 100 years since they started you know petroleum has been the main raw material all these chemicals are made from so mm -hmm. i i would say from a chemistry perspective 80 90 percent of the chemicals used are petroleum based and mm -hmm. and again that was one reason why we said does it need to be that way, right? We are no more in the early 1900. We are, you know, 2021. You know, isn't there smarter material available by now to that can do the same? Mm -hmm. And yeah, the first time I heard that number when we talked earlier, I was shocked. So I guess like one thing that I was curious at first is what makes like petroleum-based materials so attractive in this application? And then uh, I guess like kind of how can we get to green chemistry through that manner? Yeah, well, I guess, I mean, that's the obvious one, right? Petroleum, um, as many other industries, I guess, this is a cost-driven industry. Mm -hmm. and, and, and petroleum is just a um, very cost-effective material to, to create your, your products from. It's well known. So over decades, scientists have, have learned how these different petroleum-based materials behave. So if you develop new products, you know, you, you, you work with familiar substances at a low cost base. So it's, it's, I often describe the industry working in a triangle, right? And the triangle is like the, the industry for more than a hundred years have differentiated on performance cost, right? So I know what I want to achieve with petroleum-based chemistry. I, uh, and I know I can do it at a very low cost point. And this is how all these companies kind of differentiate. Am I more the, the, on the cost side, right? The cost lead, or am I more on the performance lead? But it's petroleum, right? The, the third uh, point to the triangle is what I call the, uh, the, the allow, it's what allows you to actually operate. It's the safety, it's the uh, materials usage. Right. Mm -hmm. And and that has been the qualifier, let's say, for for the textile chemical industries like, you know, what do I need to uh, achieve to be able to sell? But, you know, that that point has never been used to differentiate. And, and this is where we thought, you know, that that is a business opportunity. So we we basically flipped the triangle and now we 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 differentiate on 
performance and material or, or, or uh, safety. Uh, and we have the cost as the qualifier. Wow. So how did you, from like a business perspective, make that flip in such an established world where it's very much familiarity and cost? How did you bring, you know, these microalgae based materials or, you know, that process and make that potentially an effective substitute for petroleum in this industry? Yeah, um, pretty got to be a bit crazy, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, more seriously, uh, you know, if you're in the industry and if you work in the industry, uh, obviously you, you, you could see that other industries have advanced much faster on adopting new materials other than uh, petroleum based. And it seemed like our industry and, and, and the textile chemical industry at least is a rather conservative industry, right? Mm -hmm. And they love to stick with what they know, with what they have had before. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it became clear to me at least at some point in time that it's probably pretty hard to get the big corporations that are so good in what they do to turn hard left or hard right now. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that kind of, well, to be, to be fair, I tried and, and I always summarize this uh, in a nutshell, I failed miserably. And, and so that left two choices. Yeah, you, you really believe in there's better material or newer material available that's worthwhile investigating and you, you have to give it a go or you go back to where you have been before and be happy and stick with the petroleum world, right? So, uh, well, talking today, uh, you, you know, the choice that, that, that we have taken, you know, we really wanted to figure out um, where this new material could take us. And we saw, no, saw nobody else really putting any effort in and that, that was the business opportunity for us. Yeah, so I, I think you that story of like how you like try to go through like the conventional ways and uh, failed miserably, as you said. Uh, and I guess like the way you overcame that was by going to the brands themselves, correct? Yeah. I mean, so the, I, the, yeah, correct. Uh, so I guess uh, you've worked with numerous brands like Patagonia and Adidas. So uh, one of the most famous examples with Adidas, you had the World Cup jerseys made with your material. And can you kind of talk us how you were able to circumvent the, the blockers and go straight to the brand and overcome and flip the paradigm as you just talked about? Right, yeah, happy to. And, and, and in hindsight, of course, for us, that's a great story. Mm -hmm. uh, we, still, we still love it. Um, so first of all, I think one thing you have to commit to if you start that kind of business model is you have to commit to time. Right. I mean, you, you're you, you're tackling an industry that is, like I've said, extremely conservative, not really happy to change radically right away. So it was clear to us that, you know, we couldn't expect to come in and hoping everyone has just been waiting on us and would jump on our new products right away and implement it in, in a few months. Um, so it, it actually took us three years of knocking onto the doors of uh, Adidas and we, like you said, we specifically opted to go to the customer of our customer first, mm -hmm. because we felt if we can get the brand excited about our new technology or the uh, what we were trying to achieve, then uh, they could break maybe these hurdles or these um, the reluctance to change with their supplier if they really insist on having that new material tested and that, that that's really how it how it worked out eventually so uh, once you were able to introduce that newer chemistry is um, tangible is mm -hmm. uh, competitive um, the brands actually can get really excited and they then will help you to to introduce the product into the industry so then can we dive into, I guess, some of the details, whatever you're comfortable talking about um, without getting into proprietary details, but um, what were the textile chemicals um, that you used and what were they competing with um, for like these Adidas jerseys in the World Cup? I mean, we, um, I, I think I, I should have probably said in the beginning, um, we, we were not, I guess, the usual startup, right? All, all of us had been in that industry 
for decades. So um, something we could actually draw upon or build upon was our insight and expertise of the current state of the art, petroleum based technologies and chemistries. So we knew exactly the substances we were up against. And, and of course, to come back to that Adidas story, if once we got a call, which got us really excited that they would like us to compete for that creation of that new World Cup jersey, that obviously meant you are up against the best petroleum based, what we call wicking finishes uh, available at a time. And, and so taking your step back, you know, we are talking about a, a football jersey, right? Mm -hmm. That football jersey is made out of a polyester fiber. You know, so the fiber material was very clear to us, also how a polyester fiber behaves and how it looks like. Um, and now I guess, again, for an outsider of the industry, people would think, you know, the polyester would do the trick that if I start sweating, the sweat mm -hmm. gets absorbed and, you know, it gets wicked away to the surface and evaporates. Well, polyester wouldn't do any of that, right? So if you wouldn't treat a polyester shirt with a chemical, uh, you would feel really, really uncomfortable competing in that shirt because your sweat would simply run down between your skin and the shirt because the fiber would not absorb anything. So you need to treat that fiber chemically. And um, the, the substances we were up against were very inexpensive and very effective. You know, it's like uh, polyester terephthalate resins, for example, that, that's, you know, very old, proven, chemistries and and they they pretty much you know they some hydrophilic silicones you know uh, product chemistries we knew really well so you know i guess what we had going for us we had three years time <laughs> to really prepare for that uh, final compete so we could look at at a time our viking finish was um, based on a plant seed oil and an, an industrial plant seed oil. And, and uh, well, you know, in layman's terms, we, we describe it like we, we, we had to take a hydrophobic oil and introduce some hydrophilic groups into the oil uh, and use the oil as our anchor to the uh, oily polyester surface, right? So uh, to that respect, you know, you have to take um, the material, the plant seed oil, and add further, obviously, chemistry to it. And in our case, ideally natural-based or renewable chemistries. Mm -hmm. We need emulsifiers. You need additives to turn the oil into a water-based emulsion that you can treat the fabric with. And, and, and that selection of the right emulsifiers, the right additives, getting hydrophilic groups into the hydrophobic oil, yet have the oil still be very attracted by the uh, surface of the polyester uses as your anchor um, to stick to the surface and orient the hydrophilic groups to the surface outside. What, what you wanna do is all your hydrophilic groups need to look out so that you know the moment sweat on your skin occurs, the hydrophilic group would absorb it, wick it through the hydrophobic inner surface of the fiber out to the hydrophilic groups again, mm -hmm. you, you create a spreading on the surface and the faster and the wider the spreading, the faster or the, the, yeah, the faster the shirt will redry, you know, will feel uh, dry again, comfortable again. So uh, the trick really, the IP is in exactly that um, combination of, mm -hmm. Um, emulsifier additives and the oil and the orientation of these hydrophobic hydrophilic groups um, to have the maximum wicking and spreading. So the performance that uh, Adidas or for that sake, any sports where a company would be looking for is the best possible. And I, I guess, well, they, they have more rigorous testing than than, than, than we did in the and and we came out at as least as good as the best uh, petroleum based picking finish at a time and then adidas kept their promise because they said look if you can match the best performance um, of a synthetic based picking agent with yours then you're on
and and that's what they actually did that's an awesome story especially with adidas like pushing you forward and i guess not caring about cost to like push your material because the petroleum was probably cheaper but i guess just like taking like a wider view of the problem i guess one thing as like coming up as engineers and like the new age of engineers you just described like a really complex problem and like your company figured out a way to solve that problem over three years so i guess from someone who has never tackled such a large problem were there any like common steps you take or i don't know i feel like it would be very easy to be overwhelmed at just how many different variables you would have to select to get it all to work as prescribed uh, and that is true <laughs> <laughs> that, that is very true if i again i think this is what i pointed out uh, previously what does help us is that uh, decades of experience um, we all had under our belt, uh, our, our, you know, PhDs, our research heads, our application specialists. But yeah, it, it is really a complex matter because a textile is not a hard surface, right? I mean, a, a shirt like this has the surface area of a football field, right? And, and you know, that, that and, and you want to wash it right? And you want to have your performance also after multiple washings. So that adds further complexity in what you want to achieve. Um, it, I, I think it's, it is a combination of experience, uh, stubbornness, if that is the right English word, mm -hmm. um, the, the willingness to fail, to appreciate you're going to fail a lot more often than mm -hmm. you're going to succeed and to be ready for surprises and uh, uh, work with them. If, if, you know, I have no problem to disclose that actually that Viking finish, which eventually became one of our most successful products from a research profile was a complete fail, right? Because we looked at that hydrophobic oil and we thought, mm -hmm. oh, great, you know, from what we use, uh, what we used to know from how petroleum-like material behaved mm -hmm. that should be a great starting uh, block for a water repellent finish right <laughs> yeah. so so we were hoping to create a water repellent finish and the first time we put it on a textile and everybody was around the table and we put a a a, a few drops of water on it all waiting for the water to bounce off the fabric and not penetrate it sucked right in right so so we completely failed our profile but we we were like oh that's a great wicking finish right <laughs> and and then it dawned on us what happened right and this in in hindsight actually we learned a lot by our mistakes uh we learned a lot of, to understand how these new materials may orient on a fiber themselves on a fiber surface, how you need what, what happens if you add certain other substances to them, other materials. Um, and, and from that miss, which actually led into the creation of a new product, we also learned then how to actually better tackle the, the initial profile. So um, sorry, a long winding answer, but it, we, we are working with new material. We were willing to um, to fail. We were willing to invest a lot of time, and and I think that that there's no magic to it, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of sweat and tears, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I really admire your passion for this topic and for the company, um, and so I was wondering. I think one additional component to your success is your communication and ability to convey that passion with other brands that might be aligned in your vision. So I was wondering if you had any advice on that, because a lot of engineers will face this um, idea that, oh, this is how it's always been done. But as an, en as an engineer, we have to kind of go against that and think back to the first principle. So how do you communicate with other brands to um, combat that? Um, that's, that, that is a really good, good question, but <laughs> uh, um, it's to stay cute. Well, no, let me restart. The, I think most important is to be willing to look at the bigger picture, you know, to not get hung up on the nitty gritty details. That, that's what also happened to me in my previous corporate life too often you you became good in something and you 
kept, you know, we were running the system harder and harder, faster and faster, but it kind of lost sight of what's actually important, right? I mean, mm -hmm. no disrespect to my friends in the color industry, right? But, you know, you, you have to ask yourself, wh what value do you create when you create the 50th blue dye, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, for, for those scientists, it's, it's fantastic, right? For, for the consumer or the industry, I, I wonder how significant that that is right so for us i think to go back and try to understand the industry what the industry is actually looking for mm -hmm. uh, the impact the industry has on the planet and and to put that then now into a new context right and say look and this is why we want to be different and this is why we have started this company and this is why we use different material than all your other suppliers and Sorry if the last 99 suppliers told a different story, but that our that's ours, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 I think that that that's an easy ten easy to understand uh, a story, and I I I simply believe it's true. <laughs> For sure, there's you can form a very powerful story by starting with the why. So I really love that. Um, but let's move on to uh, the application of textile chemicals in outdoor clothing and sportswear, just really dive into that in more detail since we already started talking about it. But mm -hmm. what benefits do those textile chemicals provide when being applied onto sportswear, both in terms of performance and sustainability? Yeah, and, and I think those are the two categories we, we always have to explain and, and, and give answers to, which is exactly the right uh the right questions on on performance our industry actually works on specifications mm -hmm. right so all the brands will put out a a spec book and for whatever different kind of performance they want to achieve you really have to look at okay what are the specifications uh in terms of performance in terms of durability to washes in terms of test methods you need to uh, at least pass or succeed. So, you know, that could be like we discussed before, absorbing sweat, managing moisture. It could be repelling water, rain. It could just be softness, uh, uh, pleasant to, the, uh, to feel and to wear. Um, so what we, so the performance block is somewhat easier in a sense, because you have, you can actually provide data to show that the new material, uh, green chemistry-based um, textile chemicals can fulfill these uh, performance expectations. They either pass or supersede uh, the, the brand specifications. And, and that's really what they do care about, right? You, you don't need to come in and say, you know, uh, you want 100, now I have 200, right? It's like, you need to be able to say, I can match at 100 and you know if you have 120 fantastic right but you, you, the good thing is you need really where you need to get to with new material to have a market viable product if you don't meet that specification you 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 can't and we don't want mm -hmm. we don't want to sell green chemistry on the word green right that that's a very short lived business model yeah, yeah. Uh, so you 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 want to come in you want to say uh, we understand your specs. We understand your performance criteria. We can match those. We can be slightly better, or you know, better. Uh, and and guess what? This is now not anymore with petroleum-based chemistry. So that that's the performance side. the The sustainability is is probably even more obvious uh, in a sense that if you move away from petroleum, you have a few um, benefits almost inherent by by doing so. Right. Uh, one of the biggest issues of the textile industry is its massive carbon footprint. You know, mm -hmm. the, it's one of the, the, the industries with the highest carbon footprint of all industries. It's quite crazy. Um, and and while we can't obviously solve the overall footprint, I think we need everyone's expertise to put in that little piece of the puzzle to reduce that massive footprint piece mm -hmm. by piece. Our piece is textile chemistry. So. We have done life cycle analysis of our material, uh, either plant seed based or now even more uh, impressively microalgae oil um, uh, based. And it shows that you can reduce 
the chemical carbon footprint by up to 80 percent yeah. over the current uh, petroleum-based ones. So that that's just the carbon footprint, right? In in addition, like if you work with renewable natural material, it's easier to biodegrade, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you think of all the uh, efforts that the industry now puts into circular business models, right? If mm -hmm. you have a circular business model, you don't want any chemicals interfere with your circular processing. So natural chemistry will much less interfere, or is much easier to uh, um, uh, eliminate uh, than, than, than synthetic chemistry will be. Um, and so on and so on. I've, I've, I've missed a few now, but you know, this, um, there's, there's a lot of uh, positives you, you can bring uh, on the sustainability bit if you first, and that's critical for us, if you first succeed to match the performance needs. So how do you, once you match their performance, how do you plan to, or how have you in the past chipped away at this conservatism that you mentioned where cost is still another factor? So I know it might be a little bit easier to convince companies like Patagonia and Adidas with that already sustainable mindset to um, maybe lower their cost considerations as much. But what about with those more um, established or more conservative companies? Well, maybe I should also put in perspective on where we are right now with cost, because, you know, when I started in the, in the industry kind of 30 um, years ago, when someone came in, even at a time, the odd one came in and said, here's some green chemistry right uh, at a time maybe if you bring it down to a to not always use the same uh, print, let's say to a yoga legging right um you know it would probably have added a dollar uh to that legging and and you know the the, the industry tends to move suppliers uh on less than a cent of difference Right. So, you know, coming in and say, look, what about a dollar more? <laughs> what wasn't quite successful, right, at a time. So we knew up front that we needed to come in really into an area that we call a marginal cost increase, right? We needed to be in the low single sense or ideally cost neutral um, to, to have something to offer. And, and so that is already built into our research profile. You know, we, we, we build in a few things in our profile, eliminate as much as possible petroleum, ideally 100%, right? Mm -hmm. We don't manage it always, but as much as we can. Um, the product needs to be plug and play. That means we are not interfering with the usage of the current producing industry. Right, it runs on the same machines, same process conditions. They they can use today a petroleum chemical and tomorrow hours, and they need to change nothing the way they work. And and uh, the third one is, uh, well, I said cost, plug and play, and um, performance. Those only if we hit those three um, or four criteria. Sorry, eliminate petroleum, plug and play cost marginal performance. If we can hit that kind of profile, we would go into the industry and talk about a new product. If we can't do that, we don't have a product. And, mm -hmm. and, and that obviously leads to a maybe, well, you can call it disadvantage or something you simply have to appreciate. Uh, the development cycles to hit these profiles are somewhat longer than in my previous job, right? Um, but that's okay. That That is perfectly okay, because that's what we have been uh, committing to. Uh, I've had some, research, uh, some background before in uh, renewable space, essentially around single-use plastics, and we're talking about like tenths of a cent for a straw would mean a world of difference to these producers. So it, it really is a cost play. And then another thing to think about is what you said with the plug and play is that if we have to retool every single line, there's like billions of dollars in infrastructure, it would be an insurmount, insurmountable yeah. challenge. And so I guess like for you, um, with these natural chemistries, usually they need different like processing conditions because they are more fragile than petroleum based. Is that an issue you guys are taking on now and has solved hopefully, or is that still something in the future? 
No, that that is soft. I mean, oh, wow. that's what that's what we call plug and play. You know, if if you know, in the textile industry, they they have these very different kind of machines. So you have very different shear forces depending on the machine, mm -hmm. the, the 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 textile mill is using, and you have these massive, you know, hundred yard long stenters, as they call them, uh, drying ovens with with an immense power of air and heat. Um, but no, we, we design all the products based on natural chemicals to withstand these process conditions because we we simply knew we have to take all excuses away to not adopt our green chemistry based products to be able to argue on that marginal cost increase. Okay, mm -hmm. so that was the plan, right? The, uh, get all the other excuses out of the way. And, and just simply focus on one remaining topic, which is cost. And if you can clarify that co topic actually with the brand, the customer customer, mm -hmm. you know, you have a chance to, to really introduce uh, new material into the industry. And, and, and that, that's the approach. That's awesome. So then now that I guess that plug and play issue is, for the most part resolved, then what materials related challenges are you currently facing? I mean, there's, <laughs> there's still, there's still, you know, so if there's some talents out there, feel free, you know, come <laughs> in. We, 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 we need some, we need some help. I, I think when, when we started, honestly, uh, 14 years ago, we said, you know, ideally we want to show to the industry that it's possible and hopefully, uh, encourage more uh, companies, more individuals uh, to, to join and come in and, and, uh, and, and, and innovate in, in that direction away from petroleum, uh, knowing it is possible uh, referring to real life success uh, stories, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, what, what still, uh, for me, the biggest topic, and 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 you know, I think I, I can show you that. Take take the example of microalgae oil, right? We, you know, this this is a dried microalgae, right? So that that is a new bio based soon bio material, and and like that, you have hundreds, if not thousands, uh, coming along. The problem, we we can't apply that dried microalgae on a textile, right? It, you, you can't apply it. Even if you take that dried algae, you squeeze it out and get to the oil, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a liquid, but it's still an oil. And you cannot put an oil on a fabric. I always uh, love to choke that the only thing you get when you put an oil on a fabric is a big stain, yeah? Uh, think think of olive oil. You you you. Uh, spill on your trouser, right? Yeah, it's not a finish, it's a stain, right? So we need to turn this raw material with a lot of expertise and other ingredients into that water-based emulsion mm -hmm. that contains the oil and other ingredients that now do exactly what we want them to do once applied on a fabric. And mm -hmm. so the material-related changes is, you know, the the technology needs to move from here, the powder, just as an example, and just take that aka, um, all kind of new bio-based materials into an application the industry can work with. And, and that is not trivial, as you said, right? Um, and I'm sure that's the, not only for our industry, but I do know for sure for our industry, uh, that is a, a big challenge. So the challenge is not to find a lot of new mm -hmm. material to start working with. It's really the expertise uh, to turn these materials into an application. This is where we need more uh, material science engineers coming in, mm -hmm. right? That we can, uh, <laughs> we can confront with our textile knowledge and, and then they need to help us to turn new material into an application. So I think I keep, I think my team can't hear it anymore, but that's what I keep preaching uh, every week. It's like, we need to turn more of that new material into an application. It's not a success to find a new material if we cannot turn it into an industrial application. That's awesome. Especially when 
uh, like just finding something new is really cool and very interesting, but unless you can get into the hands of consumers, it doesn't mean as much. Um, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, one question I had was that you showed us like a vial the size of your palm uh, of dry powdered. How much oil does that actually make? Is it like a one-to-one, -one, like a vial of dry powder would fill up a dr uh, vial of oil or is it like multiple vials um, to create oil? Um, I, I, Frankly, I don't know exactly uh, mm -hmm. the amount, but it's it's highly saturated with oil. Oh, so, okay. so it is we that again. This is one of the beauties we we found with uh, microalgae, and 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 uh, not to miss to mention we we have teamed up with a great biotech partner. Um, again, that's something we love to do. Is like how can you bring in new technology, right? If you don't know all you. You have to admit to yourself you don't know all by yourself so you you know there's nothing wrong in partnering with like-minded uh, companies and in the case of uh, microalgae and and, and Synbio, we have found a berkeley-based company called checkerspot we love to work with and we learn so much from because they have all the know-how on that starting mm -hmm. material of ours and and so from if i remember right uh, this is highly saturated, highly oil saturated uh, material, so there's no loss. And, and this is why it can compete with uh, on one to one lower cost plant seed oils, which we have been working with previously, because they are less saturated, you know, you get less of the oil structure you really want to have for your product. So uh, the microalgae is not only highly saturated, but it's highly saturated with exactly the oil structure you want that gets you your performance so this is why we, we are really you know this is why we love um, to work with that kind of new material it, it gives us a much larger uh, toolbox to to play with that's amazing and you definitely set yourself up for a lot more growth when you can surround yourself and work with companies that have more expertise or um have a, a skill set that in areas that complement yours. So that's really great to hear. Um, so can you also, I guess, based on these applications that you mentioned, give us a sneak peek into um, how these green chemistries may be used in the next five or 10 years? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to. I think there's this to, more, first a more general statement. I, you know, from all we have learned so far, I simply see no reason why um, green chemistries, the, the, the multiple uh, types of green chemistries cannot replace the majority of the currently petroleum-based uh, textile chemicals. I, I simply don't, you know, with our limited resources, if, if I see how far we were able to take it, uh, we are scratching the surface. Um, I'm convinced 10 years from now, a lot of the petroleum-based chemistry will disappear. And, mm -hmm. and it should. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Why, why should we use crude oil to soften our textiles, right? That there should be better uses for finite uh, material. The most intriguing uh, prospect of green chemistry that I see for the next five to 10 years is the combination of these new materials mm -hmm. with the improving automation and digitalization of the textile producing industry. Because if you can combine these three components, uh, our industry can really transform. You know, we can, um, we need to tackle a few things in this industry badly, right? We, uh, um, we need to reduce the usage of water. This is where maybe digital application technologies will come in. You, you need hardly any, if not no water. Yeah. Um, we need to bring back the industry into the regions where it's consumed, right? Why does a t-shirt need to travel once around the world <laughs> to reach a consumer, right? This is where automation comes in, right? And, and again, if these garments eventually end up into the environment, it, they shouldn't have a negative impact. And this is where green chemistry and green fibers um, come in eventually. So actually I see a, a um, very intriguing and very, very exciting 
uh, mm -hmm. future ahead. There's certainly uh, a, a wealth of purpose-driven innovation, if that's the right term, um, um, in front of us, right? And it, it simply needs hands and heads to take it on. Yeah, and I hear a lot of like parallels, like with other industries as well. With like, for example, like a cup, you need to coat it with plastic, or else you're gonna have a soggy cup. And it's like the same type of thing. It's like, what's the difference between like a fiber from like wood and like fiber from a textile? There's like a lot of the same tangents here. So uh, hopefully we can see like what's happening in your field happen in other fields as well, which I think would be really exciting overall. But I just want to say that your passion for the space is very inspiring, and I'm really impressed with like your drive to step away from the norm and tackle what traditional textile chemistry uh, companies wanted to pursue and you want to go your own path. So we just wanted to ask you, what advice do you have for material scientists who want to explore and innovate in the textile industry? <laughs> Maybe not advice. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm not sure I can give good advice, but you know, from a learning I took from my from my career that I'm more than happy to share. And, and I, I think I did actually refer to it uh, during our um, uh, discussions here uh, or conversation. It, it's, you know, stick to the big picture, you know, understand the impact of the industry. And in our case, the textile industry that it has on the planet, uh, us, the consumer and the workers, you know, uh, and, and if you can relate your innovation to that bigger picture, if you can get into these, what I call purpose-driven uh, innovation, you, you know why you want to innovate something and, and the impact of it, you know, if, you know, if you, if you can do that, um, I think that should be exciting uh, to be part of. And uh, again, as I said before, uh, we, we certainly need more talent uh, to come in and join us. In, in, in that quest, right? Wow. Yeah, thank you so much, Matthias, for coming on to the show today. I not only learned so much about the textile chemicals industry, but now I feel just even more motivated to find that purpose and continue to pursue those passions. So yeah. thank you for joining us. Um, yeah. <laughs> thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the It's a Material World podcast. If you enjoyed the show, consider subscribing and hitting the like button down below. And if you'd like to support us on this journey or simply show off your love for MSC, we actually released merchandise. And if you'd like to check out more of the designs, visit itsamaterialworldpodcast.com slash shop or use the link in the description. We'll see you soon. And in the meantime, go change the world.